Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage Podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage, a podcast dedicated to the growth and development of teamwork, leadership, and culture in all aspects of business. Also, all aspects of your personal life. Keep in mind that what we talk about on the Teamwork Advantage can always apply in your personal life. How you can work to be better as a, a coach on your little league teams, your choir groups, your uh, homeowners associations, all of that really does come back and is very, very applicable. Each week on the Teamwork Advantage, we have a guest to bring to you, focusing in on one or two aspects of the Teamwork Advantage, teamwork, leadership, and culture. And today is no different. Dr. Joseph Michelli is a gentleman I've wanted to have on the show, probably from the very, very beginning of this, because Joseph and I have gone back uh, oh, 12, 15 years, I guess now, and we've just, our schedules have never meshed up. And he is a brilliant gentleman in the area of customer service. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying customer service. No, that, that, that doesn't fit teamwork, leadership, and culture. But Joseph has taken the customer service and changed it to the customer experience and how teamwork comes into play, how leaders can come into play, how it all works with every walk of our lives. Joseph Michelli, PhD, is a certified customer experience professional, the author of 10, that's right, 10 business books about companies like companies you've heard of, the Ritz-Carlton, Starbucks, Mercedes-Benz, Zappos, and Airbnb, just to name a few of them. And in addition to being a Wall Street Journal and New York Times number one best-selling author, Joseph helps leaders and frontline team members improve their experiences they provide to colleagues and customers. Joseph is also an internationally sought after keynote speaker on leadership and a human experience design. Dr. Joseph Michelli, welcome. It's about dang time. It's about dang time we got this done. We've known each other for so long. I mean, I think you're being conservative uh, in the 15 years. I was kind of doing the math in my head, but let's not go there. But <laughs> so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Greg. Well, I mean, I, this is all a lot of fun. Tell us a little bit about your background. One of the things our listeners love, and by the way, we've been downloaded in over 39 countries right now. So the power in this is really, really amazing. But one of the things they love is to know how you get to where you are. You didn't just wake up one morning, Dr. Joseph Michelli, PhD, customer experience professional. How did you get there? Well, you know, you know, all these overnight successes are uh, take a little bit of time. So for me, <laughs> 20 it years to be an overnight success. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's really pretty easy though. I hate to say that. I mean, I, I, I got the good fortune of going to the University of Southern California and getting my PhD. I actually come from a very modest background. My parents hadn't gone to college and one of them hadn't finished high school. So I have a very, very modest background, but had some great opportunities and great benefactors gave me the financial means to be able to do some of the things that I did and got a PhD in, in clinical and organizational psychology from the University of Southern California. Start uh, consulting a bit for a little fish market in Seattle where they throw fish. <laughs> Ended up writing a book about the Pike Place fish market and the incredible experience that they create around dead, cold, slimy fish. And then from there, got uh, the opportunity to work just across this across the street, literally from the Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle, Washington, at a little coffee shop called Starbucks, and wrote a book about that consultative journey with them. And that's where oh. we first met. Amen. It was way back. And so Starbucks experience, and then that just opens doors. Like once you get through whatever the channel, you know, uh, 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 all of the congestion in the channel, we then opened up opportunities to be at the Ritz Carlton and the rest of its kind of history, as they say. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's awesome. And uh, the Pike's Place Fish Market, I've actually got a picture of me behind the counter catching and throwing the fish. So uh, that's but that, cool. that's it. That's really the whole thing, right? The culture of the Pike Place Fish Market is remarkable. It went from a terrible workplace culture to a highly engaged culture. And then thanks to incredible leadership on the part of Johnny Yokoyama, who I love dearly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you it, then you draw in people. You create the experience for your people so that it lives inside your organization and it can just shoot out into the outside of your organization. So you attract all those customers who want to get behind the counter. 
Right. And let, let's be clear on this. It's not about throwing fish. That was their concept. Yeah. It's about throwing yourself into the model of the fish itself and doing what it is and what it takes for your industry. Yeah. In that first book that I wrote, we really focused on three principles, right? So the first is be it, be what it is that your intention is. And in that case, the intention was to be world famous pike place fish. And by world famous, we meant let's be a person who takes a world famous interest in other people. And if we take a world famous interest in other people, strangely enough, we become interesting to other people. It's not mm -hmm. about trying to be interesting. It's about being interested. And so that's the first step was to be it. The next one was to commit it. So we are going to say, I'm going to be it. I'm going to commit myself to it. Uh, I am going to publicly make that declaration to my peers. And we do it every day in lineup, right, at the, at the fish market. And then we're going to coach it. So, you know, if I'm willing to commit to it, be it and coach it, and I'm willing to, to uh, let others coach me, you create some pretty amazing cultures and a dynamic culture it is at Pike Place Fish Market. And that, that's absolutely key is when we start getting into the lineups and the huddle meetings and the things like that and the empowerment and all of that. But let's, let's take a step back if we can. Over the years, we've all heard customer service training programs for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know most people cringe when they hear, we're going to have a customer service training. There's a difference, though, between customer service and a customer experience. Give us your take on that and what, what is the difference? Yeah, so I was raised in a time when we all talked about customer service and we had very specific, you know, steps we needed to take. And uh, it was normally around, you know, complaints from customers or fixing customer problems. That's really where customer service lived. Or it was after the sale when we had to maintain a relationship with the customer, but we already got their money. Um, so it really, you know, it was a negative thing. And I wish I could take credit. You so graciously gave me credit about customer service to customer experience. I really give all the credit uh, to Joe, Joe Pine and James Gilmore, who wrote The Experience Economy. They definitely inspired me, um, caused me to write all these books with the word experience in their title. Um, he, you know, from an economic perspective, it's one thing to make a product and serve that product to the customer. It's quite another thing to envelop the product in an experience. And by that, I mean all the sensory elements, everything that drives the emotions of the service delivery. So it's a much richer landscape and tapestry to talk about a customer's experience than just typically the phase of getting it right or making it right in the journey mm -hmm. of the customer. So for me, it's an important distinction. You know, I just did a, a blog this week about uh, enveloping, you know, the, the, the importance of ribbons and boxes on products, right? Like, so if I, you I know, val Valentine's, Valentine's Day, we're going to give people, you know, boxes with ribbons on it. And so the question becomes, why do we put a ribbon on something, right? It is, and why do we wrap a present in general, right? It creates that discovery time, that anticipation. Those are all emotional variables that go beyond what's in the box, which is, what service used to be. It was the thing in the box, the product or service in the box. And so now we're talking about how do you envelop that box with bows and ribbons and boxes. <laughs> and we see that every year at Christmas with yeah. the countless numbers of advertisements of cars yeah. with ribbons on them and bows yeah. on them. Yeah. And, you know, really, truly, we could just give gifts without it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the gift is still in there. Uh, and God knows we rip through those boxes and ribbons and all that, <laughs> unless we're really little and then we love the box. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, to me, it, it speaks to how do we think like that? How do we think about wrapping our services in ways that are emotionally engaging, sensorily appealing and create anticipation and excitement? Right. And I think that's uh, really exemplified in places like Las Vegas. When you walk through a casino hotel, all the ways they're trying to explore those senses to try and um, engage you. <laughs> yeah, but I was waiting to see where this was going to go, <laughs> where they could just take the money right out of your pocket. Uh, yeah. But yeah. you're right, they're using bells and whistles and lights and sounds, and it's all, uh, it's all and, designed. And, and, and oxygen, extra oxygen, and everything else. Yeah, everything you need to stay there yeah. 24 hours a day, never leaving your chair. So it's interesting you bring that up because um, I don't know, when did you put this article out? Uh, just last week or so, a couple of weeks ago. And it's five primary customer complaints on LinkedIn. It's your blog post. Yeah. 
And I was fascinated. I don't, I don't, I assume these are in no particular order, but the first one at the top of the list is rude or disrespectful team members. Yeah. And I've got a survey on LinkedIn right now, you know, as we're talking, but, and I asked people to give me some order to that, which is their favorite pet peeve among all of these. And without a doubt, this is the one that's leading the way on the survey. So I think people really hate when they go and they're engaging maybe a, a restaurant and the waiter or waitress is rude. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even if we try to give some slack to that, like in the current economy, when so many people are just doing more with less and maybe their coworker is not available and they're covering double, double coverage, still, we hate this. We hate people who, when we show up, they don't care. Uh, if anything worse than that, they, they negatively affect our experience. Is that actually happening today, given the uh, circumstances we're in? Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> I mean, people are afraid. Uh, thank you for throwing the softball question at me. I appreciate that. They, they're so afraid right now. You know, I mean, supply chain's a problem. You know, having to explain to customers over and over again why things aren't there. And then you got people who are just stretched thin because so many other people have gone through the great resignation uh, and or are, you know, not able to work for various health reasons. Right. And it's, it's interesting because I know that where I've gone, I've actually noticed a step up restaurants in particular, a big step up in the quality of service. They're really, maybe it's the fact of where I'm going, but I mean, I'm talking about dive pubs and places like that. They're just being really accommodating, being very helpful, being very friendly. Uh, and maybe that's just where I am here in Annapolis, Maryland now. I don't know. Well, I think uh, there is some, there is some counter punch to all of this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, God, goodness knows a lot of people are just so grateful that y'all are coming in, right? You know, because they know that their livelihood depends on it. They've had a real basis of comparison during the pandemic for a period of time where they were shut down, laid off, furloughed, all kinds of things. I think people are starting to realize that, hey, maybe customers shouldn't be taken for granted because they're not always going to come in and certain circumstances can get between us and them. And mm -hmm. we need them. If anything, I think there's a greater appreciation for customers today. And, and that's that's really cool because that brings me to another question. Or I talk a lot about employee engagement, yet there's this thing called customer engagement, you know, and customer loyalty. Are customers loyal today? Well, there's that's the million dollar question. I, I'm not even. I you know I still believe in customer loyalty. It's definitely on the decline. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but let, let me go to the engagement question. I, I talk about human experience more and more because I can call somebody an employee. I can call my favorite example is I wrote a book a couple right before the pandemic. Talk about great timing. I wrote a book called The Airbnb Way and Airbnb just took a major hit during the pandemic and they're on a big resurgence right now. But but what I pointed out was on any given day, if I worked for Airbnb in San Francisco, I could have a guest in my my home that night renting a room from me on the platform. So now I am an Airbnb employee and I am an Airbnb host. Oh, by the way, next week I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to be a guest at an Airbnb. So now I am a customer uh, on the supplier side. I'm a customer on the user side and I'm an employee. I'm the same person. You know, we can call people all kinds of different things based on where they sit on a given day. But in truth, in truth, we're just people. And so if we create great people experiences for employees, the likelihood is they're going to create great experiences for customers. Uh, they're going to want to send their friends to be customers if we're treating them well at work. Mm -hmm. They're going to talk positively about us into the yeah. the internet, the ether, and we're going to say, wow, they love working there. I think I might want to go shop from them or I might right. want to work for them. So to me, this is just, it's silly distinctions. And quite frankly, if we look at the empirical literature on employee engagement metrics, whether that's a Gallup, you know, Q12 or a Gallup customer engagement metric, the CE3 right. or the CE11, those metrics just move in the same direction all the time, right? Seldom do you see high customer engagement and low employee engagement and high employee engagement and low customer yeah. engagement. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Now, I do stand corrected. Let me just add one point on that. In, in a book called Human Sigma, there was a, a little footnote that says, occasionally 
you'll have a wonderful workplace and the customers are not treated well because nobody told the people on the cruise ship that they were supposed to serve anybody else. And then it flipped it around and said, sometimes you'll have a hell hole for a workplace but they still treat the customers well because the people are such professionals that they transcend their own treatment. But that is so rare that what we should be focusing on is caring about our people and encouraging them to care about others. And I'll be quiet. Sorry, I got all excited. No, that's the issue you say. There's two thoughts that come to mind. One, uh, the incredible Herb Kelleher used to say, our number one customer is not our customer. Our number one customer is our employee. When we take care of our employees, our employees will take care of our customers. Hallelujah. You know, and the other and I love here, Herb. I love Herb, by the way. I, oh. And I, I worked with Colleen Barrett, his second in command, yep. who was his secretary when in his law firm, and then she ran uh, ran the company Southwest for a long time. Anyway, your second thought? So the second thought was the way you're talking about you know, the hellhole at one point and being able to go out and serve the professional reminds me of my days doing radio. You could be yelling in background over here, but the minute the camera or the mic went on, you were over here doing what you had to do. Absolutely. And, and, and I think we're all like that. Service professionalism requires us sometimes to get out of our own stuff right? Mm -hmm. Like we could be having some stresses in our lives and this customer comes up, they're not associated with those stresses. Let's focus on the customer or the last customer was just a royal pain. And now another person comes up, they should not be getting the residual effect of that. We have to reset and rise above as a true professional. So have you ever thought about writing a book? Somebody mentioned to me some time <laughs> ago about writing a book on this that says how to be a better customer. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. I, I'm going to do a blog on it now. That's, that's a great idea. And that's so a wonderful idea. I actually call into places because I never know if I'm call, doing a call center and I'm calling somebody, I never know if the person before me that they had to talk to was irate, screamed at them. Uh, and, and by the way, I've had the F word used at me as a noun and a verb in the same sentence. Wow. Um, them. Yeah, that was intuitive there. <laughs> but um, so what I try to do is I try the first thing I do when I get somebody on that phone call is I try to make sure they're smiling. You know, and I yeah, try well, good for you. I don't think most customers think that way. I mean, and, and look, I, I have the moniker of being the customer guy, so I should be defending customers at every turn. And I don't. I Customers want what they want when they want it. And they want it memorable. They, they want it before you could have even thought to create it. Uh, yep. And how unreasonable, right? Now, the problem is as soon as we're customers, it's all reasonable again. And so the best I can do is when I'm serving customers is remember that, but for, you know, but for the grace go I, right? Like in this moment, yeah. it could very well be me who needs that from somebody else. And I still try to be civil and I think I'm a good customer. I really do just because of what I do for a living. I'm sure that's true for you too. Mm -hmm. But, but I think most people are just about getting their needs met. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting because I just did that in an email to a general manager of a hotel, I'm planning on taking a trip in a, uh, several weeks. And I just emailed the general manager of the hotel, blah, 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 blah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've been there before, da, 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 da. And I got an upgrade to an executive suite. If only more customers realized that if they were kind, they would probably even get more than they're gonna get by being surly and angry. Oh, yeah. and, and, you know, I think this is a, a real fundamental you know, thinking issue. And I, I work with a great horse, Schultze, who was uh, just a wonderful guy. Um, and he was the founder of the modern day Ritz Carlton Hotel Company and written an, you know, just an amazing book called Excellence Wins. But, you know, Horst essentially would, would suggest to us that many people think service is servitude um, and that service professionalism helps change that dynamic. The more professional we are, the less we're going to be treated like we're servants. Uh, and if we expect people to treat us as professionals mm -hmm. and we balance empathy and assertiveness, you know, being being a service professional doesn't mean you're a doormat. And it doesn't no, mean that you not at all. You know, you have to be able to say, you know, I need to understand there are limits here and I'm very much here to serve you. But if you're yelling and if you're swearing at me, I'm going to be unable to hear your need. So if you want to comport your behavior with that of the gentleman or a lady, I'll be able to provide service to a gentleman or a lady. And that's really right. the, the motto of the Ritz-Carlton. Right. And that's company. never telling them to calm down, but describing their behavior. 
Yeah. Oh, I love it. And, and, you know, I don't know what to make of your silence. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sensing in your tone, you know, kind of a, a critical nature here. Can we get back to problem solving? Mm -hmm. um, it, it is a it's a lot of skill set here to be great at this business. And quite frankly, we need to nurture our people inside of organizations as part of our culture, help them problem solve, help them reset, help them refresh every time they have an encounter with somebody who takes their focus off the next customer. Right. So that brings us to this internal service. Um, I come out of the mortgage banking industry and I had a vice president say to me one day, uh, there is no such thing as an internal customer. A customer is someone who generates revenue for us. And I couldn't really disagree with that more because I believe that we're, Ken Blanchard talks about servant leadership. Uh, and all of that starts to come together about how we serve and working together. So when we're looking at how does internal customer service slash working with another team, another department, if you're an information uh, IT help desk professional, how does that differ from the people at the front counter at Chick-fil-A? That's a great, great question. And, and I'll actually argue on the other side for just 10 seconds and I'll get to the real point. But I loved Henry Ford's line who said, you know, in the debate about what's, what's, who's the customer, he always said, well, the customer is the one who pays for, for everything and we mm -hmm. just handle the money. That's the only function of a business is to handle the money that, that transfers through. But in all truth, um, we know that this is a false choice. Who's more important, the customer or, or the internal you know, customer? And I think that if you see, there are great debaters. Uh, you've mentioned you know, Herb Kelleher, but you know, if you look at, at Richard Branson over at Virgin, he says the employee is most important. If you look at the former head of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, he said, we want to be the customer centric, the most customer centric company in the universe. We're more focused on our customer. If we take care of them, our employees will have plenty of resources to be taken care of. You know, it's silliness to me, right? Like it's some fundamental- It's all equally love. important. Yeah, you can, and, and I don't know which of my children I love more. You know, uh, I know I have two of them and <laughs> one of them seems to bug me sometimes and the other bugs me the rest of the time. So, but but the point, I I, I go with all of this is that rather than paying attention to like who's more important, we just need to treat everyone with a great degree of dignity and importance. And I think if they're equally important, then we're not going to let customers mistreat our team members. If they're equally important, we're not going to let our team members mistreat our customers. Um, we're going to treat everyone with respect and dignity. And when there's a, a, a tension between the two, we're going to encourage this to be resolved in a way where there's a win-win. And to me, more leaders need to think in terms of the win-win, not in the who's most. So let's go back now and talk about what we brought up at first was the, the statement says rude or disrespectful team members. And then your tag on this was select service, select for service talent, develop that potential, manage reciprocal respect. Yeah, so wow, what a, what a bunch of verbiage there. What was I thinking? <laughs> so you know, I, I love that. Go ahead, go ahead. Tell me what, so uh, what, what I'm meant. looking at. A, what does it mean? But B, how do we hire? How, what should leaders, department heads, all the way through the C-suite be looking at today when we're bringing on people? Because let's face it, everybody is serving somebody. Even the CEO has to serve the board of directors. Oh, first off, I, I think right now it's a hard time to talk about this because people are almost willing to take anybody who will fog a mirror, given how tight the economy is and how tight the labor markets have been. So uh, this may not sound logical to people in this crisis time, but for me, not everybody should be serving a customer face to face. Right. They can support someone else. They can be a mm -hmm. you know, technical whiz in in some area that doesn't necessarily have a customer facing role. So. Customer facing people have certain skill sets and, it, and some of us have natural talents that if we develop can be world class stars. You know, if you think about Olympic athletes, the people who are Olympic athletes have Olympic talent endemic in them. It just lives in them. They also had world class coaches who helped them take it up to the next level. If I were to try to be given a world class coach, I don't have enough talent to put me into a Olympic 
arena, right? So we need to find the talent. So how do you assess for talent? There are many tools that are out there. Talent Plus is a company that I've worked with for a long time. I'm on their advisory board. That's an example of a company. There are plenty of others. I'm, I'm not pitching them per se. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that these companies spend time looking at what are the competencies of great service professionals and they assess them. And if you add that objective science of talent selection to really good behavioral interviewing, wow, now you can start making some decisions and select for service talent, as opposed to just accepting anyone who comes in because they have no insight on how little talent they have with people and they just need a job. So let me ask this, how important are processes for an organization, and I know this will vary depending upon the industry, but processes, how do they fit into the play of providing outstanding service? Again, whether internally or externally. It's people, process, and technology. Uh, that's what fuels great service experiences, right? Okay. So we just talked about selecting for people who are capable of executing the processes that have been designed to optimize the experience. We also have to have technologies in place today because not everything is delivered in the experience through people. Uh, in fact, we should give people choice, customers choices, whether they want to engage a person or they want to engage a technology. Often I want a self-service option. I don't need to talk to somebody. I just want to make it fast. Give me that option. Uh, there should be an app for that, right? And then after that, there are times when I want to talk to a person. I want a person to greet me. I want to be welcomed. I want a human experience. I want to opt human. Give me that option as yeah. well. It's funny you bring that up. I just, I just really chuckled there. If anybody's watching the video, probably saw me laughing. Um, I was in, before the pandemic, I was in Buffalo, New York to uh, work with a group. And I think it was the Wyndham Hotel. And I got there and I unpacked my stuff and I realized I had forgotten, I think it was toothpaste. So I called down to the front desk and I said, by chance, do you have toothpaste or where can I go to get just a quick tube of toothpaste? They said, no problem, Scott, I'll bring it right up. I said, awesome, thanks. Next thing you know, I'm there in my, in my room, the phone rings and the, the message on the phone says, Scott is at your front door, go ahead and open it. I'm like, huh? I open up the front door, there's a robot. Ah, yes, those are becoming more popular. And yeah. I opened it up, there it was, a little message flashed on the screen. Hello, Mr. Gregory, here's your toothpaste, thank you. And I took the toothpaste off the tray. Is there anything else? Nope. And he pulled away like an R2-D2 rolled down the hall. Yeah, and I'm not sure that we need a human to uh, deliver our toothpaste, so that's probably a well-designed mm -hmm. touch point. And, when uh, I went and back the fact they call him Scott. Right there. Yeah. I love that they call him Scott, though. They, they try to humanize the technology yes. as opposed to saying, our robots will be up to deliver your toothpaste. No, no Scott's the human name. Up. And by the way, they said, Scott gets tips. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so Maybe I asked some... what they do with the tip money. That tip money goes into employee engagement and fun oh. things for them to do at the hotel. Wow. That's a great story. Can I claim that it happened to me or do I, I guess I, I probably, <laughs> probably go to Buffalo. <laughs> I'll go to Buffalo. <laughs> as long as they don't serve me wings from a robot in Buffalo. That's what oh, I'm yeah. Buffalo for. But I just, I thought that was absolutely wonderful. There's a restaurant that I know of as well. And this was way before pandemic. And we talked about processes. And this is what I wanted to ask you about process. This restaurant has a system in place that is so fine tuned. Each server only has three tables that he or she works with. And if they don't have, if, they, if they're short a server, they will actually close off a table, three tables for the entire night and not see anybody there, even with a line out the door, because management says it messes with our process. Right. Well, and, and I think I'm a fan of that. I wrote a blog just on that very issue. You know, just because you're understaffed doesn't mean the customer should have to pay the price, right? Um, but aren't they paying the will... price by waiting in line longer because there's not a table? Yeah, and, and with the impact on that in the long term of my willingness to engage you could be affected. So do I really want to burn customers with a bad experience mm -hmm. because I am unwilling to forego some short-term uh, revenues? And again, I'm not judging businesses that do it. I mean, people have to survive. So, But to the greatest degree possible, we should be aspiring to create an experience that causes people to want to come back, 
not experience this at want to cause them to go immediately out of the restaurant and say, I waited two mm -hmm. hours because they were understaffed. Yeah. Um, and, and signs in the front that says, please be patient with us. We're understaffed. Do not actually make a difference. So, um, yeah, but I, I love your example. And I think great brands develop processes. You know, you go to a Ruth Chris's Steakhouse, for example, and they're going to, you know, you made your reservation. They're going to greet you by name. The server's going to greet you by name. They've got a process to hand off that name to the server. They've got something on your table that signifies this is an anniversary versus a birthday. And those things are all kind of hidden to the consumer, but it enables them to have people who are coming up to bring you bread saying, and ha you know, happy anniversary. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's that little item on the table that means nothing to you, but is a signifier to the process of being able to celebrate you. What have you seen prior to the pandemic and then through this pandemic as it relates to reviews from customers these days, whether it's on Yelp or Angie's List for contractors or whatever? Are we... Are people still, it used to be that 80% uh, of the messages were about negative experiences, only 20% were positive. Where do we stand with things like that today? Well, that's a great question. I, I wrote a book during the pandemic called Stronger Through Adversity, and I, I interviewed 140 leaders, all of whom, most many of whom I've worked with over the course of my career, about how they were trying to position their experience for the employees and for their customers. Mm -hmm. um, so these are like the CEO of Dairy Queen and the CEO of Target and Verizon. Um, and I, I just asked them how they were trying to position it because did they expect the very thing you said, that people were gonna be either happier about having any kind of experience at all and they were gonna be tweeting about it or were they gonna be more negative about it all? And so I really have taken this topic to heart. The bottom line is customers are more dissatisfied than they've ever been. The social media trending is, is still more negative. Um, and I think it's been a lot of frustration and a lot of it's supply chain, to be quite honest with you. Supply mm -hmm. chain and human it's, resources it's it today. being available. Yeah. yeah. Social media is playing a huge role today, regardless of the industry. You just brought it up a moment there. I've noticed that there are a lot of companies now that, and I've done this, I'll, I'm guilty here. If I'm not getting somewhere with an organization by making a phone call or getting something done that way, I hit social media and it's, they're back to me within, you know, within generally 30 minutes. Yep. Yeah, you'll, you'll see people who only have Twitter handles so they can complain about customer service. That's the only reason they are on Twitter is because they know that there are official responders at on Twitter that will get back to them sooner than if they called in or they tried any other method to get their, their needs met. Interesting. And are those, from the company standpoint, are those uh, um, people that they've hired in strictly on the social media and specifically Twitter? Yep, they're Are they normally, beneficial to the company? They're normally specialists at it. And, you know, the, the, the strategy often is take it offline as soon as you can. Try to get them to you in a human interaction so that this isn't happening as a discourse online. And when you right. do engage them online to direct them back to you, do it with graciousness, do it swiftly. Um, yeah. But what, what's happened is we basically said, instead of calling somebody and having a private conversation with my complaint, I'm going to air my dirty laundry in public and see how quickly they get back to me so that, uh, that this is not something that, that burns yeah. up. On and then they're going for, uh, immediately for the, uh, the DM in that aspect to try and do it. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating to watch them and how well they try and engage at that point. Yeah. And, and the great thing is if you could take somebody who is negative and then they come back with a tweet that talks about the positive experience they had, now, I mean, customers are thinking, well, even if something does go wrong, they're going to stand behind it. They're going to take care of it. And that's a that's a big differentiator. Right. Yeah. I mean, and the bottom line is things are going to go wrong. How well do you handle your yes. service recovery? Service recovery can actually win you more customers, in my mind, than had you provided good service in the first place. So I had a I had a client of mine once that said, hey, we've seen these studies and we're thinking maybe we should intentionally screw something up. And so that we have a design service recovery for that <laughs> screw up. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You're going <laughs> to screw things up already. You don't need to intentionally do something so that you're ready to fix it. Wow. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. No, but, uh, but service recovery, if they've got a plan in place. Yep. 
And, and that really does, you know, I, I write a lot on this. I've got plenty of free blogs on it that you can look at. But bottom line, you know, it really is accepting responsibility for what you can accept responsibility for, having heard what they needed and being able to figure out a solution that's workable for them within what you can actually provide mm -hmm. and then thanking them for the, for the willingness to give you the feedback that enabled you to fix it for them. What are things that managers, so let's not go to the C-suite, what are things that managers can do to keep their teams engaged, positive, focused? And again, with so many people today in the call centers working remotely, they're not even in buildings today where they're with people. These calls are now routed to their homes. And I get that. Uh, and that's actually proving to be more valuable in some cases. What can managers do today to keep their people engaged to provide that level of service? You know what I love about this entire interview? You could answer every one of your own questions with an incredibly great answer. I'm very kind of you to, to let me weigh in on things that I know you know so much about. Um, you know, for me, I think this is the big challenge of managing right now. We, we're not trained to manage a complete remote workforce or at minimum a very limited hybrid kind of workforce where we see people ever so infrequently. We are, we are manage, we're history of managing people who we can watch. We're history of managing people we have collisions with at the water cooler. Uh, and creating culture when you don't have any of that is so challenging. And I don't know that anybody's really knocking it out of the park. They're doing all of the Zoom calls. They're doing all of the breakfasts online. They're trying everything. Now, my favorite example is from, from a guy who I worked with at Mercedes-Benz when he was the CEO of Mercedes-Benz. He's now in charge of the Atlanta Falcons football business side of the football program and Mercedes-Benz Stadium. His name is Steve Cannon. And Steve said, you know, one of the things that I have been doing as the CEO of a large organization is I literally have more individual meetings with all of the people that I worked with. And I find myself building more culture because I'm taking more time. I'm dropping in on meetings that you wouldn't expect to see. And, and I'm also taking the time to listen. So I'm going to shoot down out of the C-suite just like you asked me to. And the kind of listening that he did, I think any manager can do. So he basically asked people to say, next time we have a Zoom meeting, bring something that really matters to you. And let's do a show and tell around it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and the show and tell is always about pets and kids and weddings and things that are really meaningful to people. And I think once we care about the human and we take time to invest in humans and we encourage each other to do that, we create culture, whether it's mediated by technology yeah. or it's something we have happen accidentally in the course of just being around them all the time. That That's so powerful because especially in the C-suite, people think I'm here, I need to oversee my flock. Yet by getting down with them, and Lee Iacocca, I think, did that back in the early 80s by putting his office down off the manufacturing floor, yeah. you know, and things of that direction are just so powerful. I want to put well, I'll, give you, I'll give you the quick answer to that. And he died uh, during the pandemic in a really tragic way. But Tony Shea, who was a friend of mine and wrote a book about his company, The Zappos Experience, and and I actually interviewed him just a couple of months before he died for my book, Stronger Through Adversity. But, you know, Tony had lived in the jungle. He had an open cubicle. He didn't have an open door policy. He had a mm -hmm. no door policy. Right. And I think the approachability of all of us may have increased with the pandemic. Uh, we're more vulnerable, more transparent in a Brene Brown sort of kind of way. Yeah. Uh, because we have to be. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot. I want to hear Joseph's best personal experience as a customer in the last five years. Mm, wow. Last five years. I think so that could be before pandemic or in pandemic. No, I think that that's helpful. Um, I think the, the best experience as a customer for me was just at a little restaurant where I had gone probably about three months before. Uh, and I had a very lovely person who talked to me and got to know me and, and it was really, I mean, it was more, I was just me at the restaurant. Um, but I came back three months later and they remembered me um, and they wow. asked a question about me. So I then said to them, how did you do that? I mean, I mean, what, what was your technique? And they said, well, you know, I, every night I go home and I, I just jot down a little in my journal, just a little bit about the people I served. 
Uh, and it just kind of brings them back to life to me. And, wow. and uh, but it's not techniquey, she said. It's just I just want to. I had the gift of having an interaction with somebody today, and so I just jot it down, and and it makes people more people and more memorable. And she goes, I really don't know exactly how it is that I knew you again ex from all the other people I've served in the last three months, but I did. And I just think we all want to be known, right? Like we all yeah. want to walk into a place and the cheers sort of, <laughs> the cheers everyone story. knows, everybody your, name, knows right? your name. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, it may not happen again if I went back uh, now, three months later or something, but for that mm -hmm. moment in time, just feeling like somebody really cared enough to put me into their memory Mm -hmm. when I should be just a transient thought. So that, so, was it. So that goes on your wall of fame. Yeah, that, that's extraordinary. That's crazy. So you know where I'm going next? Uh-oh. The worst? I want to know what your worst is, your wall of shame. I had somebody swear at me the other day. I, I was doing a curbside pickup, um, and you normally have to bring your ID to show that you receive the item. It wasn't alcohol. It wasn't like I needed to prove I was over 21. Um, but uh, they, you just need to show that you're the one picking your stuff up. And I didn't have it. And I said to the person, look, I'm so sorry. I don't have it. I'm glad I'm going to run back home. I just, it's literally a block away from my house. And so I ran out the door and didn't have my wallet. And so I said, I'll run right back home. And she goes, F you. And then she just shoved this thing in my car. Uh, and I, even though it's a block away, I'm not going there anymore. And it's not, it's not like everybody else who works there would treat me that way. It's just that. I've now wow. created an association with that place as being averse. Wow. I don't know that I've ever heard a representative serving somebody. Yeah, no, it was, it was really like, and then yeah. do I contact a store and do, I don't, yeah. Well, again, so let me ask you the question. When somebody experiences something bad, what percentage of the people reach out and you know, not necessarily to complain, but to let management know. And what percent just say, screw it, I'm not dealing with him anymore. I feel like I'm just saying in a blog recently, but um, in, in a blog recently, I was arguing that customer complaints aren't gifts. Gifts are what we give back to the customer when we do something with mm -hmm. a complaint. That was my, my logic. But my in there, I cited statistics and it ranges, you know, it, downward to 4%, right? So probably somewhere between four and 20% of people will complain. It depends on the industry and how much of a relationship they have with you and whether they trust that you're gonna do something about it. So there's a lot of factors, but depending upon what study you look at, it's, it's downward to 4%. So it's little as 4%. Wow. Wow, and the rest of them just walk away. And, and that's what I did. And, and frankly, you would think I'd be more inclined because of what I do for a living, but I was mm -hmm. so, in, it took me to the extreme that I didn't even want to try. I didn't even want to go there. Yeah. That's... But I told you and I told my wife and I told a whole bunch of other people, so there you go. Well, so how many, what, what does the average person tell of a positive story and what do they tell of a negative story? And see, this statistic is worthless. I'll be honest with you. I mean, they normally say about 18 or 20 people you tell in a negative event and only a few do you tell about a positive. That, those are old studies. Right now, it doesn't matter. If I, if I say it once into the internet, it's impossible to know how many people it affected. That's and what true. I assume, what I assume is that everybody has a platform right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have a great platform, Greg. You have a phenomenal platform across countries. Don't mess with Greg. He may mention it in the podcast. It could have international impact. But even the person you don't think has a platform, I think, well, that person, nobody's following them on social media. You just don't know. You just you don't, don't know these days. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of interesting. I hadn't thought about it in that aspect because I had heard some of the same numbers you mentioned. You know, the average uh, person will tell five people of a positive experience, but 15 to 20 of a negative, yeah. but that doesn't even take into consideration the social media or the, uh, those platforms today. Yeah. And if you tell the right one person and they're negative and they want to go and tell that story in their social media and what happened to a friend, it just, it's out of control. Yeah. yeah. We could go on for this for hours. There's no doubt about that. We've been going for about 40 minutes right now. And, uh, so it's been a privilege to catch up with you again. Um, don't make it another 18 years for God. Oh, I sakes. hope not. I hope not. You know, anytime you're out on the uh, East coast, please look me up. We'd love to get together. 
Absolutely. We'd and love uh, that. swap war stories as well. <laughs> yeah. Or, or happy stories. A lot of this is having. Well, war stories can be happy. That's true. It's the victory stories. Yeah. Good victory point. Stories. Good point. Good point. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate your time today. I know how valuable time is. If people want to reach out to you, what's a, what's a good way they can find you? And get, I am, get, get onto your blogs. I am mercilessly everywhere on the internet. So you could find me. If you just know my name, you're good. So it's Joseph M I C. Sounds like Mickey Mouse Club, doesn't it? <laughs> M I C H E L L I. It's M I C Hell I. Got it. Okay. And just find you on LinkedIn and follow you on there and get your blogs. Blogs are absolutely fascinating to read. Uh, great stories in there, great tips that you can pick up on and use. And you know, folks, once a week with the Teamwork Advantage, you get ideas that you can use immediately. And hopefully Joseph shared some with you today from the hiring standpoint, a little entertaining on some of the stories. It's just absolutely wonderful. Until next week, remember that having a good day is just being average. When you listen to the Teamwork Advantage, we know that you're not average. So go make today an excellent and exceptional day. Until next week, take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit TeamsRock.com. That's TeamsRock.com.